welcome everyone to today's training. What we're going to cover in today's session is going to be a review of calendar content and events in the new UB events calendar. So what we're going to specifically focus on is navigating the calendar, both the visible front end as well as the administrative back end, which you will be using to author and submit events. You're going to learn how to create and submit events as well as manage your profile. And what we're specifically going to focus on is populating the fields necessary for event creation as well as feed generation. Many of you know your events from your existing calendar will appear all over the website, and we want to make sure that that is maintained. So what we're going to first do is review the new calendar. So what you're looking at on your screen right now is the UB Events Calendar. At the very top in the blue section, it's been branded to look like one of the, I think, newer websites that are being rolled out for the university. And so that content is not specifically related to the calendar. Outside of being able to click on the UB Events Calendar name here, if you ever find yourself in an, on an event page and you can't get back, you can always use that UB Events Calendar name to get back to the calendar homepage. But outside of that, all of these links are going to be updated to reflect other website content. Beneath the header, you do have a Featured Events section, and this is a very special use area. And we are still massaging and working through um, getting some events up there to be featured as part of our implementation. So currently, we don't have any content featured, uh, but that is something we're working on. And then below the featured events is one of the most uh, important areas of navigating the front end calendar because this is where you can search and filter your content. So let's actually start from right to left and look at this search link here. When I expand it, it reveals several different options for me to filter and sort the calendar content. The calendar will default to a certain range. I believe it's uh, 180 days today, which is about a six-month period. I've actually modified it to be seven days. So you'll notice that July 27th through August 3rd is the current date, rate I'm dis uh, date range I am displaying. But you can choose to filter by your own defined start and end date. Keyword is a free form area where you can enter a keyword, and it will search things like the event title, or the event summary. You also have a list of uh, selected categories, which I'm going to explain the purpose of the category list and how it was generated when we get to the back end of the calendar. And we also have a list of campuses. Now what's very interesting about campus is that we do have very specific locations entered into the calendar for you to choose from when you're adding events. But we're making campus a searchable filter so that users can narrow their list by specific campus. And then if you wanted to filter by additional options, we've created several fields for things like uh, event format. Again, I'll explain all of these when we begin authoring content, as well as audience. And these are the ways that we allow you to come to the application and specifically find the information you are looking for. Now if you come directly to the calendar and you don't perform a search, you will see a listing of content down below. This listing will organize events by date and time and show you just the event title. There are two other view types that are in the calendar. So if you find that you'd much rather review events in a calendar grid format, you can click this little grid icon and it will then display a month worth of events. Now the content you see here is a little bit different, not in terms of which events display, but instead of showing a start time and an end time, we're displaying just start time plus title. With a grid, there's only so much information that you can show before things start to look jumbled. So in this view, we do show you slightly less information. The last calendar view option available is what's called a summary view. Now the summary view will show the most information. So I'll show you an example here, leading with emotional intelligence as one of the events. Not only do we see the title, but in this case we see a summary. And in addition to the summary, we also see the location, Davis Hall on North Campus. Now there's a little space over here uh, where the content is not aligned, and that space is reserved for an event image. 
most of the content that we migrated from your existing system does not contain images. Therefore, for purposes of the content you see today, you might not see an image. But I will scroll down because I believe I have an athletic event in the future. Oh, well, here we go. Here are some old demo events that I had um, from uh, – oh, actually, so here we go, calendar demo. Here you can see how the event image looks if there is one found. So with numbers any of these views – But here at oh, UV, certain numbers I add do up think that somebody has placed us on hold. Our 13 to 1 student That's to faculty great. ratio and our small <laughs> class size. If you haven't already, 92% of classes have on fewer on than 100 students. I'm going to post that in the chat, the Tracy. And the oh, mentoring okay. they need to succeed. The highly customizable oh. approach of our curriculum celebrates the joy of intellectual discovery and gives 100% of UB undergrads the opportunity to participate Erica, in research, service, and or experiential learning. Here, I think I can identify, so I'm going to try to find the person, okay? And more than <laughs> <graduate> <laughs> Give me one moment. And certificate programs, students from every background find the path that takes them where they want to go, wherever oh that may be. Okay, I think we are back. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, Okay, so I did place a note out so that if we are um, put on hold again, and then I can unmute that person too as well in the future. Uh, and also I just want to put out there that some of you um, may at some point chat something over to me during this call, which is okay, uh, but it doesn't alert me that there is something there. So if you do have a question, uh, please be patient as we work through our agenda for today, and I'll make sure that we get to your questions at the end time permitting. But thank you again. If you do have any questions, please feel free to post them. Okay, so as we were talking about all of these different calendar views, um, it, these are just all different ways we are displaying information. So there is going to be a default view that the calendar has, and I believe that we are settling with the list view, which was the first one shown. Um, but that might change over time if we start using more images or more features of the application. We might find that we like the summary view. Now, when you are ready to start viewing the event details of any event, all you would have to do is click the title. I did pick out two events specifically that I wanted to show because I think they do a nice job of using all of the different application features. The first one was the garden walk. So in this case, it is a title. We have a location as well as contact information. So when you were using your old system, there might have been times where you placed name, phone number, or email into a field called uh, contact name or contact email. That information is different from maybe who the um, event is presented by, or maybe there is a sponsoring uh, area uh, for this event. So contact and maybe presented by or sponsored by might be different information. The application does offer an area for you to type contact information, and when you do, it will appear up here kind of where I'm hovering my mouse. So on your event details page, it will show you uh, the full description. Uh, some of the content pulled from the old system was a presented by area. And we did include hyperlinks to old event pages. So if there was something where you referenced uh, a link or a URL to go to in your old event description, that information will appear in the event description here. So what you see right now is just information that we did pull and migrate from the existing calendar tool. Now below your event description, there are a variety of different accordions. And these accordions, when you click them, they expand and they collapse. Now, these accordions may or may not appear based on the information you're using on your event. So in some cases, you might go to an event page and maybe the Map It accordion doesn't show, or maybe the You May Also Like doesn't show. And that is just because you may or may not be utilizing specific features. Now, additional information is an area where we've created um, several different types of fields. So when you're creating an event, which we will go over today, you're going to see all of the different fields that you can populate. We've created fields that we most commonly like to capture, and the information gathered within those will appear here. 
something like cost, uh, there is a specific format to how to enter cost, but that could be a field where if you needed to use it, you could populate it. And then we have fields like audience, event format, and campus. And you saw those fields in our search area. So how these search areas work in the calendar is that searching for content is only as good as you populating it. So we're going to talk through all of the different fields uh, that we would like you to populate when you're authoring events in the system. The next accordion on the page is called Map It. Now this is going to show you an embedded Google Map. So for example, if I click this little map pin or if I click the word Map It, it's going to expose a map of the location. And then you have the opportunity to get directions. If I click it again, it will collapse. The next accordion is You May Also Like. Now there were keywords from the old system that we did bring over to the new one, and you'll see that we've mapped them to a keywords field. These appear as hyperlinks on the calendar because, and I don't know if we have a lot of events in this category, but I'm going to go ahead and actually click this and open this in a new tab, and we're going to go look at that in just a moment. But these keywords are hyperlinks because when you click on it, it performs a calendar search for like keywords. You have the opportunity when you're creating an event to free form or free type keywords of your choosing, but we also have areas of predefined keywords that you'll also be using. The last area of your uh, event page is going to be this Share It section. And this is where you can share the event on different social media platforms or potentially even download your own Outlook or Google Calendar reminder. If you wanted to email this event to someone or potentially set up a reminder, you can do that using this functionality. Any click on one of these items will pop out a window from the right-hand side where you'll populate specific information and click Submit to perform your action. Now I want to quickly go over and look at what happened when we clicked on Community Events. So I opened that up, I believe, over here in my second tab. And so what it did is it performed a keyword search for community events. So that was the keyword that I clicked on for my event details page. Now in my date range, I don't necessarily have anything that's using that keyword, but it will show me the results of what that keyword search was. So this is where it could be very important to use keywords wisely, whether it's the ones that you're manually typing or the ones that you're selecting from when you're entering your event, using uh, things in a similar format in a, you know, on a repeated or repeat occasion will really help the user experience of the application. So that is the calendar front end, and this is going to be the view that um, any visitor could see. So if, if, if a parent, students, faculty, they visit the calendar, this is the view that they're going to see. The back end of the calendar is what we haven't quite navigated to yet, and that's where you're going to be doing majority of your work. So now we're going to transition into logging into the application as well as uh, looking at my profile. Now I do want to point out that I am not part of your network. So when I sign into the calendar, it's a little bit different for me. But um, I already did sign in prior, so I might just demonstrate um, how the authentication piece works in just a moment. Um, but for uh, most, of you, uh, most of the users, down below, so if you're looking at the calendar view, and you scroll towards the bottom, you're going to see links right above the footer. Um, in fact, you know what I'll do? I will just go to the calendar homepage here. I know that view I was just looking at was shorter, but I'm just going to go back to the calendar. Oh, I've got to clear my search. That's, that's what I needed to do. So when I clear my search and I have my big long list, this would be a common exercise. So you would go to the calendar URL and scroll to the bottom. There you're going to see a Sign In button, which will log you, uh, direct you over to your authentication page to perform a successful login. Once you've logged into the calendar, you're going to be directed back to the front end. And so to get to the back end of the calendar, you would simply click My Profile. When you click your profile, you're going to now be in the back end of the calendar interface. The way that you navigate the system is going to be all of the options within your blue bar up here. So if you're looking to begin creating events, you would use the 
orange Create an Event button. Or if you're looking to get to a list of events that you've already submitted, you would click on the Events link. So everything that you need in terms of navigating is going to be in this blue bar. And I'll share with you the Events link in just a few moments. But the page that you're on initially is called your Profile page. This is going to be where you can see any events that you've favorited. So here are two events that I went to the calendar and decided to add to my favorites list. And really, favoriting event is really a way for you to track the event. Maybe you're curious about um, whether or not you want to attend. So you can favorite an event and it will store in your profile. If you've signed up for any subscriptions, which I didn't review that while we were touring the front end. That might be uh, something that we do in a future session. You can sign up for a subscription. In this case, I've said that I want to see notifications for events specifically in the arts and culture category. So if you did have any subscriptions created, which could be something like adding an alert or a notification, they would appear in your profile. And in the future, if we do things with registration, you might see any active or past future registrations that you may have signed up with through the calendar. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm first going to take you to your what's called events dashboard, and then we're going to begin to author an event. So my events dashboard as a regular user is uh, where I will see any events that I've submitted to the calendar as well as any events of mine that might be pending. So as you can see here, I created an event. I did it actually earlier today. The name of the event is called First Event. The date and time is on the 27th. And currently the status is approved. Now what we're going to now create is a brand new event record. And that is going to appear under Pending Approval as I do not have the ability to publish as a regular user. Any event requests that I submit will have to go through Workflow in order to publish. So when I'm ready to begin creating an event, I'll click Create an Event at the top. And here is your Create an Event screen. So this is the new screen that you have available to you to author different events. There are a few ways to navigate this page. The first is an orange Event Options Toolbar. This is going to be a quick way for you to see all of the features of the page and quickly navigate to them. For example, we are going to cover all of the items here like name of event and event details. But let's say I'm going back and editing an event that I've once submitted and I just wanted to update the location. I could click Location and go right to the area of that page. Next to each accordion on the page is a little black arrow. And if it's expanded down, that means that you can see all the content in that section. So if I go to another section such as contact information or images and I can't see the content, I could just click the arrow to expand and collapse that information. Scrolling back to the top of the page, we're going to begin with some of the required information when entering an event. So first things first, we're going to name it. Now I've already added one event into the calendar. So I'm going to go ahead and just call this my second event. And then I have to add a summary. Now the summary is uh, 250 characters max. So a summary is required by our system because you remember when we were navigating the front end of the system how you could see a title. And on the summary view there was also a summary area. I'm sure you recall that. So in the summary section is where you would put a nice short description of the event. You'll notice over on the right-hand side that as you type, the character count gets shorter. So if at any point you're um, putting an event into the calendar and you need more space to add your description, you might need to also start using the Add a Full Description. When you click this checkbox, it's going to pop out an additional area where it automatically copied down the description, but now I have an area to add more information. Once I'm done composing my title and my summary, 
I then have to select my date and time for the event. And you have, uh, you do have to populate just so you know both the start time and or start date and an end date, as well as a start time and an end time. Now, some events might go for an undefined amount of time. Maybe you know that something starts at 10 a.m., but you're unsure what time it'll end. You do still have to put a start and end time in the system. I'll say that this starts at 8 a.m. tomorrow. And even though I'm not exactly sure when it's going to end, I'm going to say that it ends at 10 a.m. Now on the calendar, if I don't want that end time to show because it's in a, a time I'm not really sure of, I can click Do Not Show End Date or Time. So there's a lot of options when you're putting your information into the calendar of how you want your information to display. Now we're going to come back after we're done doing one event and build out a series. And that is what the checkbox here that says this event repeats is specifically for, building an event that repeats on a specific or a unique schedule. Now as you scroll down the page, you are going to have a list of categories. Now these are the default categories that represent the most commonly used event topics or themes. And there's only a few to use. Uh, in fact, if I look at the list here, um, most of them you might find that you use on a regular basis. And there's one specifically for athletics, and that one has subcategories. But just pointing it out that these are uh, higher level subject themes. So as an event contributor, you can choose one or more category when you're entering your event. Again, these are classifications that are going to help make the event searchable. So I'm going to go ahead and choose health and wellness, maybe arts and culture, or other. And maybe you only decide to select one or two, but you'll know what's right in terms of how people will search for this information. Now examples of content that might go into an arts and culture category might be something like a concert or a dance performance. So I'm going to use that as a free form keyword right here. So these are the keywords that become hyperlinks on your event detail page. So I'm going to type concert whoop, in cap locks. And in order to add a second keyword, you could just use your comma. So I'll do concert and then I'll do movies. And these are now going to be hyperlinked keywords on the calendar. Scrolling down, we now have locations. So locations, these were, um, we put a lot of work into looking at what are some of the most highly used locations on campus in terms of the content that we were migrating over. And we assembled a default list that includes those most commonly used rooms and venues. Now these locations are searchable, and there are a lot in the system. I think we have maybe somewhere around 200 locations today. So if you know that you want to put it in a specific room, but you don't know whether or not it exists in this list, you can just do a search. So I'm going to do a search for the word Allen. Now I can see Allen Hall right here, but maybe what I'm searching for is lower in the list, and I don't know what sublocations exist within it. So I'm going to do Allen and search. It'll search my locations list and tell me that there are two results found. From here, I can use the checkbox and click Add Selected, and it'll add Allen Hall to my uh, location or to my event. Now there's one other really cool thing about the location structure in the new system, and that is the ability to use what's called an ad hoc location. But user experience and continuity are very, very important. So we want to make sure that if you are using something like an ad hoc location, that you do use a specific format, something like building name, room number, or venue. So if I were to use an ad hoc location, I would type the location in that same search field that I had used before. And exactly as you type it is how it will appear on the calendar. When you're done, click Add. You're going to then see that the ad hoc location was then added down below. You have the opportunity to keep it. If you have a typo in it, you will have to remove it and re-add it. You can only have one ad hoc location on an event. For now, I would like to use one of our predefined locations, so I'm going to click Remove. And now I'm going to go back in and I'm going to place that event in uh, Alumni Arena, maybe the bullpen. 
I mentioned earlier that there is a contact field on the calendar. There is room for one contact person that will display up next to the location. So here is where you would just type the name of the contact person. And you can type any of this information. It's not required. But it's always good to put a name and at least a phone number or an email address. Below contact information, this is when we start getting into some of the things that maybe you're not using in your existing system that are a very nice feature of the new application. Something like being able to add an image or an attachment. So when I expand the images area, there's two options. I have the ability to add images directly from my computer. So in that case, I would use the Choose File button. And then if I did have a file of pictures that I wanted to add, I could select my picture and click Open. And that would add it to my event. The other option that you can choose when adding images is from a media library. Now right now the media library only has some test images in it as we are currently working on launching the application. So what will happen when you choose something from the media library is you're going to get a list of folders. These folders might be pre-populated with images from you know, uni you know, university communications or things that you can use. Um, so I don't know if you're going to be using things that are pre-populated in the media library or doing things from your computer, but you do have both options available. So to give you an example of what a media library file would look like, you would click on the default folder or any folder that applies, and then you would see a list of images. So something like test cloud. As you can see, these are all test images we have in the computer. So when you're ready, you would click Select, and that would add it to your, to your, uh, to your event. I'm not going to do that item right now because we are still working a little bit in this area, and so I just want to make sure that our uh, creation of our event goes nice and smooth. So now we are down to two more sections remaining before you can publish. One is going to be an attachments area. And this is exactly like the media library in terms of, and I am so sorry if you hear a little bit of commotion in the background. Um, but so attachments work very similar to the images area where you can upload a file from your computer or you can app, uh, upload an attachment from the media library. Now with attachments, these can be Word documents, Excel documents, PDFs, and you can have as many attachments on your event as you would like. But all of the attachments together cannot exceed 10 megabytes. Now I have no idea what 10 megabytes is, but the system will stop you from adding more. It won't, it won't make you, it will stop you once you get to 10 megabytes. The last area of the calendar this is where we've done a lot of work to make sure that we are flagging and tagging events appropriately. So here are all of the fields that we would like you to include additional information. The first one is feed keyword. This is extremely important. This is the item where uh, it's been established by the unit calendar team leads, and these are used to build event feeds for individual UB unit websites. So in this list, these are all of the keywords that we come up with. And when you want to add one to your event, you would simply click on the item. And if you wanted to add multiple feed keywords to your event, you could use your control key and select more. So there's a whole big long list. The next field is speaker name and affiliation. So this is different from your contact field or your presented by field. Um, but this is something else where if there is a sponsoring department, uh, you would want to use speaker name and affiliation. So the name and the company or organization. And if we could keep a specific format, you'll be advised of this as well. I think that there is going to be a standard document, uh, standards document that goes out to explain things like the format for this area. The next field that you see here is cost. Now some of these should start you know, looking familiar from our front end calendar. And that is where you could put something like free if the event doesn't have a cost. If it did have a cost, you could put something like the actual dollar amount. So this is just a text field. But it is important to try to use, again, the similar format so things are consistent. And with any of these fields, 
if you don't use them, they won't appear on the front of the calendar. So you don't have to worry about uh, a field that says cost appearing on the front of the calendar. If you don't use it, it won't appear. So we have four more fields before we can publish, and that is going to be um, a list of different audience types. So much like these other fields, you can select one or multiple by selecting your control key on your keyboard. And that will allow you to place this event into uh, different audience types. Now Campus, this is a required field. And the reason that this is required while some of the others are optional is because when you're entering an event, we created a very nice list of locations to choose from. But that can be a very daunting list to a front-end user who may or may not know exactly what room or building they're looking for. So we wanted to give the end user, visitors, parents, faculty, staff, we wanted to give them a way to filter the list down by campus with maybe not searching through 200 plus locations that might be in our system. And in order to make sure that that is something that is maintained, we have made this a required field. And we do ask that events include a campus where the event will primarily be held, but as a multiple choice field, you could put multiple. So if this is something that was you know, not just on one campus, same thing. You could click and use control to select different campuses. The last two items are going to be event format and school. And with event format, these are going to be options that allow you to specify the mode or manner in which your event will be presented. And then schools, we ask that with schools that you choose uh, the school that it applies to. Again, these are all different filters on our event. Now, you can see there are a lot of options in the system, but they're all pretty easy to use. So as a regular contributor, your event request will need to go uh, through approval. So there's three buttons at the bottom of the page. The first one is Save. This means I'm not quite ready to submit my event. Maybe I don't have all the information yet, or maybe I'm looking at my event description all the way up here at the top, and it just doesn't have enough. So you decide to save it. When you save the event, it will show up in your event dashboard, but it will show a status of saved. Once you click Submit, your event is going to go into Workflow to be reviewed and approved. Once the event is reviewed and approved, it will appear on the front end of the calendar. Until then, it will only appear to you in the back end of the application or in a pending list to an administrator. So I'm going to go ahead and click Submit. And now we are back on our events dashboard. And this is where we started. Now you can see that I've already put my first event through workflow and it was approved. But now I have something under my pending approval list. So what is that? When I click on pending approval, I can see uh, the second event that we just created, who it was submitted by, as well as any actions that can be taken. So for an administrator, they're going to come review the event make sure that it has everything that it needs, and then publish it. They do also have the ability to deny it. And they might deny it for a variety of reasons. Maybe it just doesn't have all the information needed. In that case, if they denied it, it would come back to you, and you could submit changes and resubmit it into Workflow. So your event is never lost. It will always be um, in one of your lists based on its status. So if at any point, um, you know, you decided to make changes to your event, that workflow process would start over. So for example, if I go back to my event list, if I decided to um, edit it or copy it or do something to it, the version that was published will still remain live on the calendar, and the changes are now going to enter into workflow. So I'm going to pause just for a few moments because we've been going uh, on about events for a moment. I'm going to open up the chat window, see if there are any questions um, that we have. I'm going to quickly look at our question list in the meantime. And actually, I don't see that there were any questions that came through. So wonderful. So if you do have questions, please make sure that you hold on to them, whether we handle them today or they are covered um, with some of the teams afterwards. I really do appreciate your attention to learning about event creation. Okay. So now that you've seen how to create an event, and you understand that 
um, any uh, events that were already approved will appear in your event list, and any events that are pending will be in your pending approval list. Let's go in and do one more and have it be a series event. Now, a series um, can be anything. It could be something that, you know, it occurs every Tuesday for, a multiple, uh, for multiple months. Or maybe you have an event that just happens to span more than one day, but you don't want it necessarily to span all the way from Monday through Friday. Maybe it's something that occurs Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of that week. So whenever you have a scenario where you have an event that doesn't occur just at one date or time, we would create what's called a series event. And again, we have to include a summary because that is required by the application. Now, when you're creating a series, what's very important is to set the very first day of the occurrence. So let's say we have um, a new event that is occurring. Let's say this is something that happens on the second Wednesday of every month. Navigate forward to the correct first day. So in this case, it would be August 9th. You want to make sure that you put whatever your times are. Or if this is something that happens to be an all-day event, you can bypass adding a start time and an end time and click all day. In this case, I will uh, I'll actually leave it all day for now. Now, once you have your first occurrence set, and you click This Event Repeats, you're going to get an additional drop-down menu of options. Here you have the ability to set, is this something that happens every day? It might say every Wednesday or every month on the second Wednesday. So this list is pretty specific. It's because the application is looking at the date of your very first occurrence and trying to figure out what the pattern is. And that's why it's important to set the very first occurrence with the correct dates that you'd like. Now, in this case, this is something that I want to occur every month on the second Wednesday. So when I click that option, I have an additional option to populate, which is the specific schedule. So in this case, if I messed it up and you know, August 9th wasn't exactly the correct date, I could actually say that this schedule in particular happens on the third Wednesday. So maybe the first one happened on the 9th, and then every one thereafter was the third Wednesday. And then I would choose when does this series end, and I can choose by date. or I could choose by number of occurrences. Now I'm going to make this just the second Wednesday so it actually is consistent. Um, but there are other options available. So first thing I'm going to do is I want to show you some of the other options, but I, I'd love to share with you what happens once you're done building your schedule. So you can go through and populate all of your other features of the page, but I do recommend when, before you publish, so I'm going to go, and I, I know I have a few required fields in here, so I'm just going to select Downtown Campus. Before you submit, I recommend doing what's called a save. That's because saving the event will create the schedule for you. That way, if you wanted to specifically look at any of the individual occurrences, or maybe change one of them from an all-day event to something that happens from 6 to 8, you have the option to change any specific dates or times in your pattern. Now here, if you uh, didn't extend your series long enough, you can on a one-by-one -one basis click to add occurrences. So in this case, uh, maybe I meant to end it sometime in October. So I can put that in here as well. And you can see how you can modify your schedule. Now I'm going to go and submit this one into Workflow, but I want to come back and show you some of the other series event options because that is not the only one exists that exists. So I think I have everything that I need to submit it. And something else important that I, I didn't get to share with you yet because we haven't edited an existing event, but there's something called version control and change log in the application. And this is your ability to see what are the changes that have been made to this event over time. So you can see not only changes you've made, but if an administrator made any changes, you would be able to track that information in your version control and change log. In fact, expanding any one of these options would list out all of the things performed. So I'm going to click Submit because I, at this point, am done with that series event. But I am going to go to Pending Approval to show you something quickly. So um, in this option, your series will all show up as individual occurrences, 
but on the front end of the calendar, they are all grouped. So here, um, your administrator will be able to approve the entire series when they review one, but in the interim, they will all display as unique occurrences in your pending approval list. So that's why there's actually four items now pending approval. And I apologize to any tenant administrators on the call because you're probably getting a lot of notifications from me today. So we're going to go back in. We're not going to um, finalize uh, submitting another series, but I would like to show you some of the other functionality within the series. So I'm going to do something different. We're going to choose the 28th as my start date, and I'm going to choose again this event repeats. And now you can see my drop-down menu does have slightly different options. So instead of it saying every Wednesday or every second Wednesday of the month, you see that it now says Friday. So again, system trying to guess what the pattern is. So what happens when I choose every day? When I choose every day, it does ask me how long do I want this to go, by date or by number of occurrences. So that's very similar to the first pattern. If I were to choose every Friday, I actually get a pop-out of specific days of the week. And this one might be more commonly used. Because here I can say that this happens every Tuesday and Friday of the week. And same thing, you always have to set the number of occurrences or the end date for the series. And those are probably uh, the most used, I would say, between the every you know, insert weekday option and um, maybe doing something just every day for a period of time. There is one last option, and that's when there is no rhyme or reason to my pattern. When you click Manually Choose Dates, a calendar is going to pop out, and all you have to do is point and click in order to add individual occurrences to your event. So here there is a really nice feature of this grid. If you wanted to select an entire week at a time, you could click on the number along the left-hand side. You see how it kind of highlights some of those uh, occurrences, some of those days? So this will allow me to quickly select everything in that list. If I click on something again, it disappears. So I could kind of come through and do that and then just click a few things off and I have a three-week schedule very quickly. And as always, I always recommend once you're done building your pattern, go down to the bottom and click Save so that you can confirm that everything looks correct. And when you're done, you would click Submit. Okay. Now the only other button down here that we haven't covered is this Discard button. So I just want to mention what that is. So discarding is not the same as deleting. If I choose Discard, it's kind of like I'm in a boat waving a white flag. All I'm doing is abandoning whatever work has already been done. So in this case, if I've never saved my event and I click Discard, no record of this event ever occurred. If I had saved some changes and then went back and made some more changes and then clicked Discard, it will only um, have saved the, the items made before I clicked Save initially. So everything up to Save would be maintained and everything changed thereafter would be discarded. So when I click Discard, my event list is actually going to be the same duration, as well as my pending approval list is also still for events. Okay, so a couple other things on our agenda today. I did want to show you how to edit an event and also talk to you about some of the benefits of copying an event. So first things first, here's an event that I've already submitted into Workflow, and now I'd like to make an edit to that event. In order to edit the event, I can click on the name of the event, or I can use my Actions drop-down and click Edit. Both of these are going to take me back to the screen that I used to author the event originally. So the same interface is here for you from creating an event to modifying an event. Now what's interesting though is any changes that I make need to go back into Workflow. So I'm going to uncheck um, other and put this event into entertainment and recreation. And maybe that's the only change that I'm making. When I scroll down to the bottom and I click Submit, and as you can see here, I've got a change log of things going. In fact, it looks like somebody probably got my notification and, oh, this was showing the approval. I'm so sorry. So here is when I originally submitted it, and then the next user is the one that's actually approved that event. So that's the one that was already approved to the calendar. So now when I click Submit again, another uh, record is going to be created, and that's going to go into Workflow. 
So now I have something else that's pending. So what is very good to just make sure that we understand the difference between is the one that is still approved and live on the calendar, you'll see here. And this is going to have all of those details um, of the one that's published. The changes, however, though, are now going to be shown in a pending approval list. And as you can see, it says pending version. And then I'll have an opportunity as an administrator or whoever is reviewing that content to review that version and either approve or deny those changes. If they approve those changes, your records will merge together. And if those changes are denied, the original record will still be published. So going back to my event list, the last item that we wanted to cover in today's training before we open up to uh, maybe a Q&A would be how to copy an event. So there are times when you put a lot of effort into an event. And it's an event that uh, repeats year after year, but you're not creating that schedule years in advance. So what you can always do is there's a very nice feature where you can create a copy. So when I use my Actions dropdown and I click Copy, it's going to take me into a screen as if I'm creating a brand new event. <laughs> the difference is all of the details are pre-populated, and they exist exactly as they were originally published. So when I look here, I already have my summary and my description, and even the date and time is the same. So this is the most important area when cre uh, copying an event, is that you don't just copy it and publish it, that you copy it, update the date, maybe update the title, and then when you're done, you can go down to the bottom, and you can see everything is exactly maintained as it was originally. And you can click Submit. Submit will send it into Workflow for one of your uh, unit representatives to submit. And by the way, I'm using the word administrator from a terminology perspective. There are certain roles, user roles in our system, and then there's specific user roles that we've created for the University at Buffalo. So a regular user, which is what we're demonstrating today, will have their events go through a different type of administrative user. And there, there are a few different ones, but I just call it an administrator. So in this case, I don't want to save my copy, so I'm just going to click Discard, and I'm still back on my event dashboard. So just to give you a little bit of a recap, we've been playing in the back end of the calendar. And so if I am here and I want to get back to the front end, all I would have to click is View Calendar. This will take me back out to the front end where I can see my first event that was published. And if I scroll down to the bottom and I want to get back into the back end of the calendar, I can click on My Profile. And from My Profile, I'll have the ability to create an event or hover over this uh, Events area here. And when I click it, that takes me to my event dashboard. So the primary views that you'll be working with are going to be the front end calendar, maybe for searching, filtering, checking out events, clicking on my profile, and managing anything like your registrations, favorited events, or subscriptions. And then your events link will take you to your events dashboard. And that is when you, where you are going to author and submit your events. So. Our agenda for today in terms of navigating the calendar, logging in, creating an event, as well as your events dashboard, we've completed. So we now have an opportunity for a Q&A. I would say I'll go on a momentary uh, pause. I'm going to check out if there have been any questions submitted through chat. And Tracy, if there's anything that you would like to offer or have us add, I am more than happy to go over additional features in the time remaining. I don't think so. I think we'll open it up for questions. If you have questions you'd like to ask now, please do so. If you'd rather ask them offline, that's fine too. You can um, reach out to me, teastman at buffalo.edu, and I'll make sure you get an answer. And if the question is uh, a commonly asked one, we'll make sure we update our help information to include that uh, answer. Thank you, Tracy. There was one question. So um, I'm sorry if somebody was just coming off mute. I, I do want to just address um, there is a question brought up, and it was meant more for, I think, a web developer of a specific team. But it was about if there is going to be a new RSS feed with new variables to the new calendar. 
And so I do want to just express that we have done some work as the project team for the calendar to migrate data from the old system to the new and bring over some of the keywords that were originally used to create event feeds. And we are currently in the process of creating new feeds. I think that we're using an XML format for those that um, are interested in the technical terminology. Um, uh, but there are various options available. So we do have representatives of different teams that will be able to go into the system and build new feeds using all of these classifications that we've been covering today. So feeds can be created based on feed keyword. That is the primary way. But additional feeds can be created based off of different variables. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, yes, and then there Eric, was I just, one. Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to clarify that um, the folks who will be enabled to uh, work with feeds and feed keywords will have a designation of technical lead. So um, if you haven't uh, spoken with your senior communicator or the uh, your unit's calendar team lead, make sure you do that um, because they would be the ones to assign or determine who who within your unit is is going to be a team a technical lead. Wonderful. Thank you, Tracy. And another great question was brought to, um, to this about the notifications. So there are different notifications that you will receive from the calendar application. When you submit an event, a notification goes to administrators to approve. And again, administrator is the blanketed role that I'm mentioning. But there are going to be different unit representatives responsible um, for publishing content uh, for, for specific users. So a notification will go out, and then for those of you who are on the receiving end waiting for your event to be approved, you will get a notification of whether something was approved or denied. If it was denied, you're welcome to ch check the change log, um, maybe to see if any notes were posted as to what content is missing. And you can resubmit an event back into workflow. Sometimes it's just maybe that it doesn't have enough data. Um, or maybe waiting on information. So any event that is denied will come back to you, and you as a regular user would be notified. So we're still on the back end of the calendar. If there's any other questions, please let me know. I am going to go to the front end of the calendar just to kind of um, you know, let you see and digest and take in some of the new interface. And I did, I, I did mention something earlier that I didn't have on the agenda, but we got through our agenda pretty quickly today. I hope it wasn't from me talking too fast. But there was an area where you could create what's called a subscription. So um, Tracy, I would like to show that. Would that be okay if I show how to create a subscription? Sure. Wonderful. And then there was another question that came in. I'll be happy to answer that one next. So event subscriptions are things where Maybe you have an interest in a specific category or location, and you just want to have a, a, a feed of events in your profile that match those parameters. You can create something called a subscription. So for example, I'm going to go to the top, and I'm going to click the category for entertainment and recreation, or you know, health and wellness, because that is truly something I'm interested in. Once I uh, select this category and click Search, my calendar is filtered. Now, there is no event that matched this parameter right now, but I can still build a subscription. So the process to build a subscription starts here. Once I've filtered my calendar, I can click under the Subscribe area this red Add Notification. What this is going to do is add a subscription for health and wellness. Here you can choose what subscription type. Did you want this specific filter, or did you actually intend no filter? So if you did mistakenly try to sign up for events to the whole calendar, um, and it wanted it to be a certain filter, you kind of have a, a little bit of a checkpoint here. So I'm going to say current calendar view filter. I have my email address, and then it says you have to go through sometimes the I am not a robot. And when you click Submit, it's going to say that alerts have been configured and will be sent to your email address. Now, everybody on the call will have a profile on the calendar site. So if you wanted to change or remove that subscription, 
you can do that from your profile. So your subscription allows you to get emails about events within certain categories. But here is where you can manage your actual live calendar subscription. So you can see that I now have two. And then there was another question that did come in, and it was related to um, an area of the Create an Event screen that I kind of glazed over. But um, I'm glad that it was brought up because we do have enough time to cover it. It was about editing the event URL. So I'm going to go into the Create an Event screen. Now when I first go and begin authoring an, an event, there is an Event URL field. Now I want you to watch what happens in this box. And, and something that I want to point out, I cannot edit the event URL, the first portion, everything that comes in front of the word um, event. So I can't, I can't modify any of that. But your event URL becomes what your title is. So I'm going to put title of event. Whoops, sorry, can't spell. Now when I click down into summary, where I want you to look is down here. So once I click in out of my title field, my title becomes my event specific URL, replacing the spaces with dashes. Now you have an opportunity to change the title of the event. So if you have a very long event title, I will tell you I've noticed and witnessed a, a lot of very, very long event titles uh, in the calendar. So if you wanted to shorten the specific URL of your event, you could do that. You could just call it title event. However, if the URL has already been used, it either will tell you or it will make it unique by adding a number to it, something like dash 1 just at the end. So the system will never allow you to use the same event title twice. It will always you know, put some sort of numeric value on the other side of it. Now, once you've published an event, and this is where I'm going to go back out to my events view. So I'm not going to save that event. I'm going to go back into my first event. And that same field now looks a little bit different. So because we've already published the event, we don't recommend going back and editing the title because somebody could have bookmarked it, placed it somewhere. For the most part, the calendar, you know, it will automatically update the event URL. Any feeds will automatically update event URLs. But now that, it's been, now that the event is live, we don't want to just change our event URL. So if you did need to change it, you can click this box. The calendar will tell you that it's not a good idea. But when you click OK, you'll still have the ability to go in there and change that, first por that last portion of your URL. And that is um, the event URL field portion. Now for everybody on this call, we did record today's presentation. There is a standards document that goes over um, some of the ways that you are going to be. And Tracy, is that something we're presenting out as a standards document for some of the fields and why we would use them? Yes, um, I'll be sending okay. after this call. I'll send a link to that, uh, as well as the a link to the recording. Wonderful. And as well, there are other resources that our um, our company has. And so, as those items become available, whether it's items developed specifically for this group or ones that exist for all of our customers, we'll make sure that that information is submitted out. Um, and again, you know, there might be times where um, that you might get a notification from somebody on, I don't want to call it the calendar team, but there could be a different notifications that come out about when should you start using the new calendar? Are there features you should hold off on using? Um, today, um, you know, I might say, hey, don't, don't do this part or this part yet just because maybe we're still working on it internally. But um, for the most part, you'll, you'll get all sorts of updates, information as needed uh, for this application. So any other questions for today's presentation, or would you like to get a half hour of your day back? <laughs> Are there any other questions on your end, Erica? 
No, I don't believe there are any other questions for, for me. I want to thank everybody so much for joining um, today's call. And uh, also as well, even though this is, um, it's, I'm actually saying this, I apologize for any background noise you may have had at times. It might have made me talk a little bit faster or slower or sound out of breath it's because I have a little cocker spaniel, and Tracy, you're aware of this, and she sometimes likes to make an appearance on my training. So for those of you who are dog lovers, um, thank you. And for those of you who are not, thanks for being patient. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and end our recording, but feel free to stay on the line if you were nervous about asking a question while the recording was going. So please stand by. <laughs>